A good morning. May peace be upon you. We are continuing the lessons on educational theories. Today we are going to talk about is behaviorism, which is first of the five theories, which is based on behaviorist orientation or approach. Behaviorism theory, the important thing is the environment. Rather, the stimulus in the environment which are produced. And the most important component of that environment is the teacher, which provides the stimulus. A teacher-centered approach in which the educator role is to manipulate the environment for the learners to elicit a specific response. Therefore, if we want to produce a response or a behavior of the student to learn, if the teacher who is going to provide a stimulus in the environment, which is going to reinforce that behavior of learning, manipulates the environment to elicit specific response, repeatedly manipulates the environment to elicit specific response, a specific response becomes automatic and internalized into the student. Let me explain to this diagram. This is a student. According to behaviorism, we are considering his mind is just a black box. This student shows a behavior which is a response. And this is the environment where a teacher is standing. It manipulates the environment to produce a stimulus. The teacher gives a stimulus which could be a positive or negative reinforcer, which results in the response output. If it is a positive reinforcer, then the behavior is going to increase. And if it's a negative reinforcer, that behavior is going to decrease. If we go into the history of this, initially by developing educational theories, people did not know about the brain and the mind much. So all experimentations of learning were done on animals. And later on, all experiments or data was collected. Students were teachers were done on small children. Thorndike used animals easier and more ethical than using humans in their search. He called the approach connectionism, connection between stimulus given to animal and how animal responds. You see this thing. Now this person is showing a bone and a ball to a dog. Isn't it? Because of the food, the salivation is starting. But since he is seeing both, a time will come when only on showing the ball, the thought of bone will come. And the response of salivation and hunger is going to be there. So the learning is through association and learning through reward and punishment. The behavior is that you want in this child that he should study. So therefore, if in study time he is playing, you scold him, that is a punishment. Chances are he is going to study. If you find a student, a, a, a child who is studying and you give reward to him like an ice cream, then he will feel happy and he will study more. This is learning through reward and punishment. As a great work of Pavlov and Skinner. Let me give you example of behaviorist learning theories. The first is stimulus response theory. 
It is a concept in psychology that refers to the belief that behavior manifests as a result of the interplay between stimulus and response. It was developed in 40s and 50s by Clark Hull and later Kenneth Spence. Associative learning theory, another theory, is a form of conditioning, a theory that states behavior can be modified or learned based on stimulus and a response. So therefore, behaviorism is a learning theory or a paradigm if you want to call it an orientation approach and under it you have is a stimulus response theory and you have is associative learning theory. In fact, if you see stimulus response theory, associative learning theory, the names are different but they are talking the same thing essentially. So therefore they can be called the same things. This means that behavior can be learned and unlearned based on the responses it generates. Using both positive and negative reinforcers can be used to change behavior as previously I was giving you example in the diagram of a child. If responses are not reinforced, then it is likely that it will not be repeated. For example, we have seen this thing, if somebody is going in a home, uh, if a child is doing something wrong and you just ignore him for some time, then automatically that behavior goes away. This is called as extinction. Responses allowing escape from undesirable situation punishment likely to be repeated. So therefore, if there is a behavior that mandates a punishment should be given and punishment is not given in some form, then chances are that person is going to repeat their behavior. And mind you, when I am using the word punishment, I am not talking about corporal punishment. Punishment could be many times, many times. Just few words would be said or something like that. Let me give you an example of positive reinforcement in a classroom setting or in a teaching setting. Awarding good grades for work, what is well done. Allowing students to watch a video for finishing. Verbally rewarding students for their effort and hard work. This is called, this is the positive stimulus. And mind you, when we are using the word positive or negative while developing the stimulus, it doesn't take, gives the connotation of positive means something good, negative means something bad. Positive means something is being added and negative means something is being taken away. Like a positive charge and a negative charge. A positive charge gives electron, a negative charge takes electron. And a positive reinforcement could be by removing something. And obviously, if we remove an aversive stimulus, that is, we give a negative stimulus, students going to learn. For example, it's choosing to do homework. Doing homework or extra class of these things, that is not a good step. This student don't feel like doing it. So from their perspective, it is an aversive stimulus. So they remove it, then that's become a positive reinforcer. Example, example of a negative reinforcement, let us see. Removing risks from a student, negative is equal to removing a pleasant stimulus, not allowing student to sit with his friends, which he enjoys, using the chart to document the number of times student misbehaves. This is a negative reinforcer. And since the stimulus given in this thing is a negative because something is taken away and the thing is taken away is a pleasant stimulus because you want that behavior to be stopped in a student. Punishing a student, for example, adding a, is adding a versus stimulus. It's the positive because something is being added. For example, it could be as simple as that. You can ask the student to kindly stand for some time. Or it could be as simple as that. 
telling someone that you're not doing a good thing. If you see this chart, we're talking about the revealing the same thing. Add, remove, add means positive, positive. Remove means negative, negative. Stimulus could be either omnipresent or reversive. So therefore, if you add a pleasant stimulus, it enhances the desired behavior. If you remove an aversive stimulus, it will enhance the desired behavior of learning. If you add an aversive stimulus, it will deter the undesired behavior of not learning. If you remove a pleasant stimulus, it will deter the student from an undesired behavior of not learning. So with this, we come to the end of a lesson today. So in the next lesson we are going to talk about is cognitism. But before do that, an important thing I want to tell you, what are the educational implications? In absence of reinforcing stimulus, the desired behavior is likely to disappear. I have talked about that. So educational and educational behavior are a behaviorist approach is useful when developing learning objectives or designing competency-based curricula. The behaviorist approach to medical education is, fre is frequently used in development, evaluation of clinical skills, instruments, and simulated case scenarios. You see, when you try competency, write a competency, then you say this thing, by the end of this program, somebody will have that competence and competence is by the way visible in the behavior of the student. See, learning outcome, by the end of this time, the student will be able to do that. These are verbs and verbs can be seen in the behavior or it can be seen in the thought behind the behavior. So, writing learning outcomes and competencies are in fact the result of behaviorism. On the flip of the coin, if a behavior is being shown because of the stimulus, you take with that stimulus the chances of the behavior which was bad to come back comes again. A classical example is if one is driving fast and if a policeman checks it then you get a ticket. It is adding an aversive stimulus to stop the behavior of high speed. It's a negative reinforcer so that the speed should be low. Now certainly if you enter in an area and you are sure there is no police officer, your brain takes over and you start driving the car with increased speed. Immediately when you enter in an area where you find police, you start showing the behavior of driving within the speed limit. So have a good day. Continue your pleasant smiles, brilliant smiles. See you in the next lesson which relates to cognitivism.